Ben, how are you? Good, buddy. How you doing? I'm doing, you know, hanging in there. Yeah, well, I guess that's probably what the best most of us can say is, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's about right. And I think everyone is really curious how, you know, how you're doing um, through all Yeah, that. well, I, actually not bad. Um, I had this one uh, completely stupid, idiotic um, accident. Uh, it's actually very complicated. So all I'll say is I ended up cracking a few bones in both feet, if you can imagine. So that's been um, extraordinarily more than anything, irritating, because what it really means is I can't really move around. And so for the better part of a month, I've literally been bedridden. Um, so almost 24 hours a day, I just sort of lie in bed. And of course, you can do research and work and all that. And, and I do, and you stay in meditative states and awareness, of that, and I do that. Um, but it really does have the net effect of just kind of slowing you down. Yeah. So I've just been kind of saying, okay, fine, lying in bed 24 hours a day, enjoying myself, just uh, letting the subtle energies, you know, move through my body and enjoy the feeling and, and occasionally ecstatic release that those offer. So it's been fun. Um, on balance, I'm looking forward to getting back into a little bit more um, active work. So mm. we'll see how that goes. Uh, continue to try the wig, check it out. Feedback's been very interesting. It has been. Um, <laughs> mostly I'm surprised, honestly, at how positive it's yeah. been. It, it, yeah. it's, it's really kind of shocking. Um, but I, I'll continue to talk about that as it goes on because it really, it's a very real experiment for me. I, I mean, I really am trying something. Um, today, I know we had um, some topics that we thought about discussing, particularly the impact of coronavirus virus on the world situation. And on this slide that we've been seeing for some time now into regressive populist autocratic dictatorship type of um, government systems. And that's truly a problem. It's very real. Um, there was, up until the mid-80s, there was a significant reduce in military dictatorships worldwide and, and a rise in democratic um, foundations. And then starting in, in the 2000s, there's been a slow decline in democratic um, political systems as these more autocratic, populist, occasionally dictatorship types of regimes tend to take over. Mm -hmm. And of course, something like the coronavirus, what that does, it's made to order to implement public emergency measures, which in effect give dictatorial powers um, more extensive control mm -hmm. over the population. And, and that's a real issue. And we'll come back to that and, and mention it. Um, but I thought one of the things that we could do, um, and I, I don't mean to sort of spring this on you, but I think we'll do just fine. But I wanted to just mention um, the, the really core issue that we're dealing with when we deal with something like a, a coronavirus. And that's just what is the appropriate approach to health care? Yeah. What's a genuinely integral approach to health care? And why, in particular, do we not have any integral approaches to health care? Right. Um, I mean, we have something called integrated medicine, which is followed on complementary and alternative medicine, which follows on orthodox medicine all of them manage to be less than integral. It's a real feat of, of brilliant uh, engineering and thinking to manage to avoid the sum total of the important issues that need to be addressed. It shows a real talent in there someplace, I'm not sure where, but uh, certainly not sure that I wanna uh, dig it up and, and uh, use it myself. Um, but there really are just some, some fundamental, straightforward issues. And a lot of people are going to find them maybe a little far out, a little bit goofy, uh, and so on. 
And I'm, but one of the things I want to do, uh, an awkward approach, of course, simply means that, that we look at all quadrants, all levels, all lines, all states, all types. That's just one of the very shortest summaries we use to cover the bases um, of when we're dealing with um, a, a, a integrated or a comprehensive view, view towards um, something. And including all quadrants we call showing up, mm -hmm. including all levels we call growing up, including all lines we call opening up. And one of the lines is the line of defense mechanism. So there's levels of shadow material and dealing with that we call cleaning up. And then dealing with all states includes higher states, altered states, peak experiences, things like Satori, Ken Show, enlightenment, awakening experiences. So we call those in general waking up. And then of course there's just types and typologies. And those are just meant as kind of a catch-all category. So some people, and types allow you to flesh out whatever particular topic you're working on. So some people, if they're just working on day-to-day -day psychological issues, they'll use the Enneagram, um, the most widespread conventional model of psychology, except in the West today is the um, factor five analysis hmm. model. Mm -hmm. um, it's completely an uninteresting model when it comes to actually explaining and getting some sort of insight into why people are doing something. It's simply a big data statistical analysis of if you look at all the characteristics that people have, how do they bust down? Um, so what characteristics do females tend to have, do males tend to have? and it, they're broken up into um, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and negative emotions and eroticism. And that's it. And, that, and that's, those are fine. We include all of these if you want a comprehensive approach. But notice that there are no things like developmental studies right. in that, those five factors. You're just agreeable or you're not. You can't be agreeable at, at egocentric, at ethnocentric, at world-centric, at integrated stages. That's very different agreeableness at each of those stages. It doesn't look at states of consciousness. So are you agreeable from just um, a gross, waking, isolated, separate self sense? Or are you expanding into a subtle state? Or are you expanding into a causal state? or into some of the ultimate states of unity and non-dual awareness. So it, as, as models, the typologies, things that are actually called typologies, don't tell you all that much, um, but we include them because they're important. And it, I say it's a catch-all because there really are sort of thousands of different types of typologies, depending on what area you're, you're working in. But that's what allows us to take an integral approach it takes the fundamental elements of quadrant level design states and then supplements those with different types depending on what specific area we're working in. Are we working in sociology? Are we working in politics? Are we working in weather? Are we mm -hmm. working in physics? And, and, uh, and so on. <laughs> so one of the things that I want to get around to, for example, um, is, and just to show how a little bit far out and goofy it might get, <laughs> is we're going to focus a little bit on the upper left quadrant, even though we'll discuss the other quadrants, because as a pandemic, as an epidemic, by definition, it's affecting a collective. Right. And so how you deal with collective issues and how you deal with individual issues, they're intimately interrelated, always. That's what the four quadrants means but they're also different perspectives on these same things and they have different methodologies and different approaches, different zones and so on. So we'll want to be looking at that. But when we do look at the upper left quadrant, I'll just mention two examples and this is directly related to immune system function and protection from viruses. Mm. So one of the things that people will want to be doing as this thing starts to peak is doing everything they can to make their individual immune system function 
as well as it possibly can. Now, there, particularly starting in the 80s and 90s, there was an enormous amount of research done on emotions and immune system functioning. And there were a couple factors that showed up consistently. And so even today, most orthodox physicians agree with this, but they'll never mention it. They'll never bring it up because it has to do with left-hand quadrants and they just deal with right-hand objective third-person material, cells, bacteria, virus, systems, stomach, brains, that kind of stuff. They don't deal with interior um, emotions and feelings and, and awareness and that type of stuff. But two of the main conclusions, and again, these are pretty much uncontested today, is that severe, particularly prolonged severe negative emotions depress the immune system. And that just goes sort of right across the board. And people that are in those types of negative emotional depressed states are really open for an enormous number of illnesses, so really sort of across the board. Um, and not just ones due to infectious agents like viruses or bacteria, but ones where the immune system should be cleaning up cells that are starting to be aberrant, like cancer cells. Mm -hmm. The immune system should be cleaning those up. If you have a persistent, profound, prolonged, negative emotional state, you're not going to do as well in that. And again, that, that's largely uncontested. Now, an uh, interesting thing about the negative emotions and you don't tend to see this so much, although there are psychological studies, but you do tend to see this in a lot of spiritual traditions. But one of the keys to unlocking negative emotions is forgiveness. Hmm. Now, this is not something that human beings are used to doing. It's, it's not something that, that comes with the territory. Right. So when we were on the African plains for 300,000 years. And by the way, virtually all of our physiological evolution occurred during the 290,000 years that we were essentially original hunting and gathering tribes. And we didn't start with civilization and the rise of sophisticated spiritual systems. We didn't invent writing or mathematics until we invented farming. And that was really in the last 10,000 years of our history. So our physiology, our Darwinian physiology had already been set for 290,000 years. And then we only got 10,000 years of, of adapting to the present. The average biological age, according to Gerhard Linsky, of the original indigenous tribes. And by the way, when I talk about original indigenous tribes, I mean the tribes as they actually existed 300,000 years ago. I don't mean any tribes as they exist today. I'm not talking about indigenous people today. They continue to evolve and grow and develop. And that's an entirely separate issue. So when I say tribal consciousness, I mean what you would have seen, felt, experienced 200, 300,000 years ago. Mm -hmm. The average lifespan of that period was 23.5 years. So among other things, that didn't give us a very long time to adapt to most of the problems that we face today. Most of the problems, like even longevity problems or aging problems, those don't happen when you're 23. They happen when you're 40 and 50 and 60 and 70 and 80. And that's where all our problems are. And we have no Darwinian evolution to help us out through all of that. By the way, it's also... I, I might have mentioned, I think I mentioned when we first talked about why I was trying out a wig, that I had a shaved head all of my life, and that often monks, east and west, or spiritual people, east and west, would often cut off their hair as an indication of their detachment from the world. And particularly for a man, going bald, cutting off hair is an extremely hard thing to do. When Treya had cancer, I remember reading a study where they took some millennials, at this point they were in their like 30s, or early 30s, and they had developed cancer, but they had also developed significant baldness. And so there were studies saying, which do you consider more traumatizing, getting cancer 
or going bald. And a slight majority, about 55% of the men said getting bald. That's so surprising. That had, and one of the reasons is since for 300,000 years, we only had images of other humans, all of whom had hair. <laughs> Nobody went bald when they were 23 years old. If you were bald, it meant something was missing. So something that was part of you was broken. It was like missing an arm or missing a leg or something like that. And so cutting off hair is a very traumatic kind of event. And when people see a bald person, that primitive, primitive 300,000 year old mind looks at that and goes, ah, that's bad. So it's a complicated story and uh, part of an ongoing little experiment I'm doing by, by um, I'm also starting to let my hair grow back in, but I, I prefer doing a wig right now because I really can't stand the feel of hair growing in after 50 years of not having hair okay. growing, <laughs> um, growing in. Well, the other, um, the ironic thing about that, Ken, is that male pattern baldness is so strongly correlated with high testosterone levels. High testosterone levels and it's transmitted through the mother. <laughs> it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, totally fascinating. Anyway, so <clears throat> forgiveness is when, when human beings separate and um, become in a sense, whether you polish out, say, wherever there is other, there is fear. So whenever we're separate manifesting to each other, we have both the chance for love and care and concern, but we also have a chance for hatred and aggression and even murder and killing. So we're in a very ambivalent position with each other. And when it comes to our negative emotions, hatred or anger or resentment or revenge, those almost always have some sort of blaming activity. We either blame other people for our problems or we blame ourselves. And either one is essentially the same thing. Because either one, the cure for it is forgiveness, a really deep, profound forgiveness. And we'll get into that and, and what it means. But as I said, because forgiveness handles negative emotions so well, and since negative emotions are a primary depressor of the immune system, then practicing forgiveness, you would think, would be a primary prescription that physicians would give to patients right. that had infections or that were in danger of getting it. But no, you don't hear it at all. And the same is true of the positive emotions. On the positive side of the street, well, ecstasy, joy, the thrill of letting go, transcendence, all of that, those are all connected, the way forgiveness is connected to the most negative emotions. These positive emotions are often connected with gratefulness. And so what you'll see in spiritual traditions, and our good friend, Brother David Stendelross, is one who actually has an organization called Gratefulness, dot or mm -hmm. I highly recommend you check it out. Gratefulness is a very, very profound shifter of emotions into a positive stance. So, and again, this is not a natural stance that human beings develop because we had no reason to do that for over 300,000 years on the African steppes. Yeah. So, I mean, at the end of the day, we don't sit down and go, okay, now we can all relax. I'm so grateful that we got food today. I'm so grateful that, no, we sit down, we relax and go, okay, let's get ready for the predators that are gonna eat us tonight. <laughs> and there's just a whole changing over. You're never in a position where you're safe and you can go, God, it's wonderful to be alive. Isn't it wonderful to be alive? And you start sharing that God, it's great to be alive. Uh, sensation you get as the sun comes up every morning. We didn't get that. So uh, uh, several empirical studies, orthodox psychological empirical studies, because people just don't tend to think in terms of gratefulness, they had them do very, very simple practices. And I'll recommend some of these at, at the end. One of them was each day for just five minutes, don't make a big deal out of this, but just before you go to bed or something like after dinner or something like that, just write down three things that you're grateful for that happened that day. 
And that's it. Just make them up, but come up with three things that you're grateful for. Do that one week. Do that six or seven days. Studies show that that will increase your happiness quotient from 20 to 30%. Mm. It's astonishing. And here's the kicker for just doing that practice for one week. The results last unchanged for six months. Wow. And it just shows how the, both that the brain is open to this and that it's never had it. It's sort of like it's starved for, oh, that's gratefulness. Wow. And so when you find somebody like Brother David Stendhal they'll use gratefulness as a primary meditative practice. And of course, what you're doing when you really plug into gratefulness is this other utter gratitude for the simple joy, the simple isness or thusness of being alive, and the simple joy that we can exist like this. And virtually all of the mystical traditions maintain that that joy and that happiness is plugged straight into the divine. That's where it comes from. The divine is a superabundance of overflowing in ecstasy and joy and love and care. And when we plug into that gratefulness, that's what we're plugging into. And when we also forgive, we're removing all of our negative judgments and blaming about all the things that are wrong and all the people that have made our lives miserable. And these two simple practices, forgiveness and gratefulness, are both two factors that the brain is just not used to doing, so it's not part of our natural psychology, and they're directly plugged, not into the functioning of the relative self. They will make your relative immune system hum. If any two attitudes are gonna change your immune system, that's it because they're plugged into negative and fundamental positive emotions. If you watch on the positive side, studies have shown again that if people even watch a movie that they find authentically funny, genuinely funny, and they, just, they spend an hour and a half laughing and letting go and in that sense transcending, and then they check their immune system and it's up 20 to 25%. I mean, it's astonishing. So again, forgiveness on the negative side, gratefulness on the positive side, and these are the two most fundamental attitudes, states of consciousness that you can take in the upper left that will have the greatest impact on your immune system. And also, I want to talk about this a little bit as well, because this collective epidemic um, they all have certain, all epidemics have certain things in common, certain things that are different. One of the things that most people have noticed about this particular um, pandemic is that it does seem to increase a kind of negativity because now we're all each other's enemies. It's mm -hmm. like, oh, I, you know, I can, I can get this from you and die. I'm going to wear a mask around you. Um, I'm going to wear rubber gloves around you. We all become this isolated. Um, we're trying to put on hazmat suits wherever we go. Full body and condoms. That's not, yeah, that's not good for communion, obviously. But what it is good for is a chance to develop agency. And at the same time, one of the ways that we bring forgiveness into this is that, and again, there are things you should do in all four quadrants, in all state and so on. I'm not denying that. But I want to just touch bases with the, with the four quadrants. But one of the things that we have to do with each other is the typical person is sitting here going, oh God, that person is my enemy, that person, I have to avoid them, I have to avoid them, I have to put rubber gloves on for them, etc. They feel the same way about you. Right. So what's the only cure for that on both sides of the street? Forgiveness. Mm. Just forgive the other person for being the threat. That's exactly how they see you. I used to ask Treya if there was anything about cancer that she appreciated. And she used to just almost light up and in the most positive, authentic, genuine terms. It was shocking 
how much she actually meant this. She said, oh, I, every day I'm deeply grateful to cancer because it makes me feel connected to all of the human beings because all human beings get sick and we're all eventually gonna get sick and die. And when I just feel cancer, I can just feel my connection with everybody else who is suffering and has an illness. And it really has come home to me in ways that I never realized before. And it was clearly part of the strength with which she approached that, that dreadful illness. And so something like that can be an attitude that we can bring to this situation, which is not only, I hate you for ruining my life, but thank you for showing me how connected we all are. Right. This really is a serious interconnected thing. So we'll, uh, we'll run through uh, some of the quadrants, some of the things uh, that go on um, in each of them. Did you wanna, um, since this is a little bit new, um, in terms of, of the um, protocol that we're going through, but do you want to say anything up to this point? Should we just keep plunging in? Yeah, I mean, we can, we can definitely keep going. I just, I just want to thank you. I want to extend to you my gratitude um, just for creating this, this field that we're all sitting in now. Um, right. I, I uh, again, this, you know, this, this, this particular question wasn't, uh, something we were planning for and the fact that you you um, are leading with this and you know the funny thing is I think this you know the last 20 minutes or so actually directly answers some of the questions that'll be coming up later yeah um, you know one of the things that that I found myself thinking about as you're talking Ken is about how you know so we've got gratitude we've got empathy and we've got forgiveness and gratitude as you say is sort of um, you know it's our connection with the absolute Right. Um, right. And then that connection with the absolute, that just divine presence, that, that, that fullness spills into um, how we empathize with each other. And right. you know, I think it's important for people to remember that we are, I mean, empathy has been here from the beginning, but it's developmental. So, you know, 300,000 years ago, we had empathy, but it was empathy for the family or for the clan. And it didn't extend very much further than that. Right. And what's interesting about forgiveness is it seems to be making our empathy, our circles of care more porous, like through forgiveness, we're actually expanding our circle of care. Like you, like I cast you outside my circle of care, but in the act of forgiveness, I'm actually bringing you in exactly. and my we gets bigger. That's why forgiveness is connected straight to God, just like gratefulness is, although the gratefulness is more obvious. But I see, both yeah. operations of the divine. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely love that. And how there's just sort of this straight line that leads right. through your heart from form into emptiness and back again um, is, is, is just gorgeous. Yeah. 